Greetings, this is Jared Love, and this video is an update for my matrix constraint video. I've made some promises in some of those older videos about doing an update for the new matrix stuff that came in with Maya 2020. So that promise is a little long overdue. So thank you so much for bearing with me, those of you who are supporting my channel, and welcome to any new people. Okay, so just to kind of briefly overview what the previous video was, and I'm still going to leave it up because I feel like there's a lot of good information in it that you can still look at and learn from. And then there's also a lot of good comments there too. So I didn't want to remove all of that stuff. But basically what this is, is about using matrix nodes to replace the Maya constraint nodes. So briefly in this scene, what I've got is a locator for a driver node. And then I've got a group node with two cubes underneath it. And the two cubes are driven by the two different methods. So you've got these constraints, a parent and a scale constraint. And then you've also got the matrix network, like what was uh, resulting from the previous video. So you can kind of see right off the bat that the matrix method is a lot cleaner than the constraints. Now, part of that is because you've got these extra constraint nodes that show up in the hierarchy. So it kind of clutters it up there. But then there's also all of these connections. You've got so many connections coming from the driver into the constraint, from the constraint into the driven, from the driven into the constraint, and even from the constraint into the constraint. So <laughs> lots of just spaghetti mess connections. And this is also really hard to untangle in the node editor. Aside from that, there's also this cycle because you have information coming from the constraint to drive the driven node, but then also that information pumps back into the constraint to manipulate it further. Now, this is a benign cycle because obviously the developers made it, and so they made the code able to diagnose this and understand how to process that data. But it is a cycle nonetheless, so there is going to be a bit of a hit in computation speed. And then looking at the matrix one, it is much cleaner. There's far less connections. And so while there are the same number of nodes in this case, there is no one node that does the whole thing the way this does. So you can see here if we, you know, move, rotate, scale, they're both staying together. And you would be able to see that pretty easily if they weren't because, you know, they would kind of separate like that. So it's just there to kind of help show what all is going on. So I'm going to go ahead and just delete these constraints and I'm going to shift this connection stuff up here because I want to use this second cube to kind of demonstrate this new stuff. So there we go. Oh, uh, one more thing kind of for the overview. The way this is working, you've got this Molt Matrix node, which is a node for taking two or more matrices and then multiplying them together, creating a new matrix that you can then use to drive something. The order of connections in here is important. And the way I've kind of in my head figured out how to remember how this is working is whatever you plug into the first one, you're putting that into the space of the next one. And then if you have a third, you're taking the resulting matrix of those and putting them into the space of the next one. And then on and on and on, you're putting resulting matrix of everything into the next one and the next one and the next one. So yeah, so that's basically how this is working. And in this particular case for the constraint method, what we're doing is we're taking the world matrix of the driver and we're putting that into matrix in zero and then we take the world inverse matrix of the parent node of the driven node and put that into matrix in one now you could also you just use this parent inverse matrix you can plug that in there too but that's going to create that cycle of connections and so why do that when you can just grab this node's parent and then grab its world inverse matrix, which is the same exact matrix. So that's the non-cyclical way of doing it. Okay, so with Maya 2020, they added in, uh, among other things, this offset parent matrix attribute. So if we plug into that, you'll see these two cubes are still behaving the same as each other. So a couple of differences in just how they're connected to be aware of. You've got in the first one, this is the one that has the decomposed matrix. So all of these attributes are connected to something. So you can't actually go in there and move it or rotate it or anything like that. So um, it does kind of lock off what your driven node is. Now, the one connected with the offset parent matrix attribute is free. You can move it and scale it and, and do all that kind of stuff. So it's almost like it's parented, which 
in effect is kind of how this offset parent matrix is working. You're essentially overriding what the parent's matrix data is for this node. So that's kind of the way to think about it. Even though it's parented to this group node, it's got this offset parent matrix, which is basically like, this is what your new parent matrix is. So if that's a way to kind of help you understand what's going on here. Now, one thing that is nice with this method is it's pretty easy to say, I only want to do like the translates or maybe I just want to do translate and rotate. You can connect just one of them. So if I then, you know, do this and then if I rotate it, you see the one that's rotating is the second cube because it's taking the entire matrix data from the driver, which is the one we multiplied together. But they've added in, along with that offset parent matrix, some new nodes as well. So you've got a pick matrix now, which if we plug in the matrix sum into the input matrix here, and then I'll plug that output into this one, the pick matrix has these use translate, use scale, use rotate, use shear that you can deactivate if you want to. So that now you can see the rotate and the scale are doing nothing, but it's only taking that translation data. So that's a pretty cool thing where you can actually just specify, I only want the translate information or the rotate or the scale, whatever you're wanting to do. So same number of nodes, however, with this offset parent matrix, it's still doing that same work and it's just plugging in directly into a matrix. So that's really cool. You're not having to deal with all this translate data and decomposing the whole matrix to get that to work. So. I'll just go ahead and plug this back in here again. So that's something that's really cool to be aware of. And I'll go ahead and connect these again. Uh, there we go. So another thing that I'll run into a lot is I'll have a situation where as I'm rigging, I may want the uh, translation and scale data from this driver but the rotation isn't working right for whatever my purposes are. And I really would like to use the rotation from this one. So the way you would have done that in the past is you would essentially recreate this whole network. So if I just grab these, I'll connect them in real quick. So this is my other driver. So I'm going to grab that world matrix zero, plug that into the in matrix zero and then take my parent nodes, world inverse matrix, plug that in, plug in the output into the input matrix for my decomposed matrix, and then I can connect the output rotate, say, to this. So now, and let's hide this for a second just to prevent any confusion. Now you see this is taking the rotation from this node and not from this one, but the scale and the translate are still working, whereas they are not doing anything here. So that's you know four nodes and even more if you had to take the scale from something else if you wanted to. So you'd have to do the same molt matrix setup for all of those different drivers. So one of the other cool nodes, which I really like, is this blend matrix helps if you spell it right matrix there it goes so this blend matrix node well got to show all attributes and so my initial thought was taking the new multiplied matrix for each of the drivers that i had and plugging that in but uh, you can actually skip that by going from the actual driver nodes themselves and plugging those in. So if I plug one of them into the, work with me here, Maya. If I take one of those and plug it into the input matrix and then I take the other one and plug it into one of the target matrixes, then I can create, I'll just duplicate one of these. I can effectively use this to create a new driver matrix and then use that as my in my first matrix for my matrix in so the zero and then i'll use this for that and let's plug this into here so if i unhide this guy now and then you'll see it's over here 
But if I grab that blend matrix node, I'm looking at it in the attribute editor now. For any of your target matrices that you put in here, you have those same checkboxes. So you can actually turn all that stuff off and just use the rotate. So now again, you know, and again, these, these two cubes are being driven differently, but we're getting the same result. So rotation doesn't do anything from that one, only the translate and scale, and then the scale and the translate aren't doing anything here. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty cool thing where you can essentially, instead of four nodes, you're actually using two nodes to do the same work and you're plugging directly into that matrix attribute. You're not having to decompose the matrix. So that's just amazing. That's so awesome. Now, another benefit or cool thing about this blend matrix node is, let's go ahead and turn these back on. You can use this weight attribute, which you can plug into and drive. So you could create a, a blender attribute to blend this on and off and you can, you know, have it go back and forth between the others. Now you can actually overshoot, which is interesting. I'm not sure why they did that. It's pretty cool though. I'm not sure how that's going to play out for an actual rigging use. I haven't thought of one yet, but that's uh, something that you can do. So that's pretty neat. And so it basically takes whatever this one is and overrides it with this. And so if you obviously put it to zero, then it's going to be nothing. If you put it to 0.5, then it's going to be halfway between. So pretty neat stuff. Now, another way you could use this to do the same effect is if I, let's just make another blend matrix because I've got something plugged into that input matrix. Um, Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to take the, let's move it up here so it's easier to reach. Uh, I'm gonna take the world matrix of one of them and then I'm going to take the world matrix of the other and put them both into a target. Uh, so now that I've got that, let's hijack this molt matrix since it's already plugged in there. I'll just move this over here to hopefully help avoid some confusion. And so with this now, I can say, don't use the rotate from the first one and don't use anything but the rotate from the second one. So again, rotate's working there. Translate, scale is not, and scale and translate and the rotate is not. So same effect, but so if I turn these back on, now, I had originally thought that what you could do with this is have like multiple blending on and off together, but I'm not quite sure how the blending actually works on these. It seems like whatever your input matrix is, if you don't have anything in there, then it's essentially going to be at the world. So what that will look like if I turn both of these off, you know, this guy is at the world. So even though if you move the group node, and stuff, it's still gonna stay basically locked down to the origin. Um, but then when you turn these on and off, it's gonna blend from the origin to this new location. So originally I was thinking if you put both of these to 0.5, then this is gonna be halfway between the two. Um, but as I move these closer together, these should be basically right on top, you know, now, but it's not. So what it seems to be that it's doing is the blend matrix is kind of taking your target matrixes, putting them together into a new matrix and then blending that with whatever your input matrix is. So yeah, it's, uh, it's not quite as simple as that. However, you can put this to one and this one to 0.5. So this is the target zero and this is the target one. And this is going to be halfway between the two. So it'll take probably some clever connections on these weight plugs if you had say more than one thing that you're gonna blend between to where you make sure that basically whatever you're blending from or two is gonna be one and then if it comes later in the order of your targets that that's the one that you're blending off to get to this other one. And so you're not blending one on while you blend one off. It's like you want this to be a value of one and any in between you want a value of zero except for the last one which you're blending on and off. So it'll take some clever, uh, probably using some condition nodes and stuff like that to get these to drive correctly if you're gonna blend all of them together. But 
The simple case is gonna be just this one. If you're blending two together, you'll have one plugged into the input matrix and one into a target. So that's a really cool setup and just an awesome note. I, I freaking love that thing, uh, especially for this type of thing where it was like uh, basically replacing what this old system was doing with just these two nodes. It just kind of blows my mind a little bit. I'm, I, if you can't tell, I'm geeking out over this, obviously. <laughs> so, okay, I think the last thing to really talk about is doing offsets. So let's go ahead and, and reconnect this one. And I'll connect this here, which means I can now get rid of all of this stuff. So I don't really need this stuff anymore. There it is. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to basically create an offset. So if you were to parent constrain something with an offset, this is essentially what it would be like. So what we want to do is have this now behave like it's still constrained, but it's basically having this offset from that pivot location that's right here, like this cube. Now, already right off the bat, you can see this is doing it. So by, so this is one method you can use is just taking this guy and moving and scaling, rotating, all that stuff to get that new offset put in. So that'll be fine if you don't need access to these attributes for something else. If you do need access to those attributes and you want them to be clean and zero, then you're gonna have to go in and put an offset into the molt matrix. Now we did see that in the previous video, so you can see that, but I will go ahead and kind of go over it. So what we're gonna need is another molt matrix. And so what we wanna do is we wanna put the matrix from the driven node into the space of the driver node. So we'll take the world matrix and we'll plug that into the matrix in zero of this molt matrix. And then we're gonna take the world inverse matrix not showing up there so we'll just kind of world inverse matrix here and do that so this is going to give us that new matrix and for the sake of visually understanding where this is going i'm going to create another attribute on this group node for this offset matrix so i'm gonna do mc add adder the group one is the group node obviously ln for long name is offset matrix so that's the attribute we're adding and then at for attribute type matrix so it's adding a matrix type attribute once that's there you see it shows up right here we'll take the output of this and plug it into that offset matrix so now just to kind of quickly take a look at it we can see here is that matrix and oh that actually brings up something else that's really cool in that update from my 2020 they added this composition option so you can look at the matrix either as the matrix data itself with the columns and rows or you can look at the composition where you can actually plug in translate rotate scale shear values and generate this matrix without having to know what the x vector needs to be in the y vector and the etc so you can really easily kind of look okay here's my matrix and oh, okay this is what creates that matrix so Really awesome stuff there. I, I love that update too, because it's a lot easier to see. And you can go in and tweak this. You can change these numbers and it will update the matrix here. Okay, so now that we've got that plugged in, we can sever this connection and it's still going to maintain that matrix data. So that's helpful. Uh, okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that offset matrix and we're gonna add it into the molt matrix. Now, it has to be the first one, so remember the order is important. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this offset matrix and put it into the space of the driver, and then we're gonna take that new matrix and put it into the space of the parent. First off, basically what this is gonna be is you take this and plug it into input zero, and then you shift your other connections down one. So there. Okay, so now, when we look at this, our cubes are following this as if they're parented, but you notice they're not coincident. So this cube is the one driven with the decompose matrix, and this one is our other. So remember though, 
because of the way the offset parent matrix attribute works, it leaves these channels open. So all you have to do is remember if you're putting in an offset into your matrix, your molt matrix, then you need to zero out that stuff from your actual driven node in order to put it into the right spot. So that's going to make it so now they are coincident again. So that, my friends, is pretty much it for this video. I highly recommend using these offset parent matrix attributes and the new nodes like that blend matrix node. Awesome stuff. The pick matrix, of course, when you need it. And yeah, so, so much simpler, much, much more versatile and not as heavy. So there's less connections and less computation going on because you're not having to convert it into these translate values so that Maya internally converts it back into a matrix when it's figuring out what this needs to be positioned and oriented like in space. So anyway, um, yeah, that's it guys. I hope you find the video useful. Please feel free to leave any comments or questions and have a blessed day.